Half-Life. A game that truly needs no introduction. A game that revolutionized its industry. A game that has inspired and intrigued millions for over two decades. A game that, until recently, I'd never completed. Now, I'd known of Half-Life, of course, for a long time. I'd played its sequel in the episodes, the Uplink demo, the official demo, and the Portal games with which Half-Life shares its universe, but I never actually played the 1998 classic all the way through before. The game and its lore always fascinated me, however. I last played through two in the episodes about six years ago. Through browsing the wiki and watching the numerous videos created by extremely dedicated members of the community, I've recently become very interested in revisiting the series. I figured I couldn't just skip to two this time, though, so I fired up Steam, gave Valve some more of my money, I did like a minute for the download, and then I was on my way to Black Mesa. First off, and no this isn't an original point of praise, I've always respected the game for how it never wrangles control away from the player. You are Gordon Freeman, even when he's not killing headcrabs or dodging tank shells. The entire first, like, 20 minutes can be boring as hell on repeat playthroughs, but it's obviously important in setting up the world. Anyway, Gordon makes an oopsie in the test chamber, and we wake up to find Black Mesa invaded by swarms of hostile aliens. We all know the story from this point. You kill thousands of aliens, struggle to climb ladders, exterminate the entire US military, and end the Zen forces invading Earth. G-Man propositions Gordon, roll credits. Nothing I've said so far has been unique in the slightest, but I feel I can offer something different. See, everybody I've seen that adores this game seems to be coming from a similar perspective. They've had this game in their lives for a long time, and they've played it for a long time. They're far more familiar with the game than I probably ever will be. I've been familiar with the lore for a long time, and I played through two a few times when I was younger, but I never properly played Half-Life 1 until this year. That's where I'm coming from. Since I didn't grow up playing this, I went into it with relatively fresh eyes. As I experienced it, removed from its original context, the 90s, and without the luxury of rose-tinted glasses, well, I admire Half-Life. I appreciate all it did for video games as a medium. I love Valve and most everything they've made since. I love the community it created. As a game, though, just a game, removed from its historic significance and any innovations it made, solely as a game, I think it fucking sucks. Now, if you didn't just click off the video in disgust, you're probably thinking, what? How can you say that? Half-Life Mary is adrenaline-pumping action with a masterfully crafted atmosphere and ingenious storytelling. And to that, I would say, okay. The point of this video is not to tell anyone they're wrong for loving this game. This all being said, even if you don't agree with me, I hope I express myself well enough that you understand why I feel the way I do. Saying you don't like Half-Life 1 is a very easy way to get yourself ratioed. Although I may sound like a contrarian dickhead at times in this video, I swear I'm not trying to be. It appears quite baiting that the first video on my channel is a negative Half-Life analysis, I understand. It just ended up being something I was really keen on making a video about. Alright, I think I've softened the blow as much as I can by this point. Let's get into the video proper. Now, I'm not about to sit here and tell you the storytelling or plot in Half-Life is bad. All in all, it's one of my favorite aspects of the game. The story, at least by the end of the first game, isn't anything extraordinary at first glance, but there's a lot that can be gathered if you're willing to really comb over the details. Since control is never taken away from the player, it stands in my mind as a shining example of video games as art. I know that conversation is basically dead, but I mention it because I'll always respect games that are willing to stand on their own merit. Essentially, Half-Life takes full advantage of the fact that it's a game when telling its story. Half-Life should only ever be interactive. That's not to say its storytelling methods are always amazing, however. Sure, the scripted events and environmental stuff is basically all great, and it was probably mind-blowing back in the day. Other times, though, you'll just be sat in a room with a scientist dumping exposition on you. Sure, most of the time you have the freedom to ignore them and run past, but that comes with the penalty of not knowing what the fuck is happening. These very direct moments offer a contrast for how vague the game can be otherwise. Now, let me preface this by saying that no, I don't want every piece of information spoon-fed to me in a game. Developers making players do research on their own is generally great. Game worlds feel much more alive and are much more interesting when not every piece of lore is handed to the player. Basic World Building 101. This being said, sometimes I think Half-Life is way too vague for its own good. You really gotta work overtime for some of this stuff. Now, for insignificant details, I can forgive the ambiguity. Some major plot points, however, are given almost no exposure. If I traveled back in time to 1998 and asked someone who just finished the game what the plot was, they'd probably say something along the lines of, A science experiment went wrong, opening a portal to an alien world. Aliens invaded Earth, we killed a lot of them. The military was sent in to kill everyone associated with the project, we killed a lot of them too. We went to the alien world and took out their leader, thus ending the invasion. Some weird government guy offered us a deal, and I accepted it. I'm sure that's what a lot of people thought. Pretty clear, cut and dry. That's mostly what happened. Think about it a little more, and you'd probably figure out a couple more details. G-Man being involved with the experiment, the fact that he stalks you throughout the game, the alien hierarchy, etc. 
What you're not likely to pick up on is that even the Nylons, like the Vortigaunts under its control, is enslaved by a higher power. The idea of the Combine was kind of present in the first game, but you could be forgiven for not catching that at all. The main things that point to them is an extremely rare Nylons line. They're slaves, we are. They're slaves, we are. And a close look at the Nylons model. It's been outfitted with cuffs, like the Vortigaunts, for mind control. It has some obvious modifications, like the grafted on third arm and whatever this is coming out of its ass. The thing is, though, it's obvious because I'm looking at a picture of the model on a plain white backdrop. These are some pretty major story implications, and they're given no attention. Not like there had to be an elaborate cutscene showing the Nylanth off, but hell, even Crowbar Collective missed some of these details when making Black Mesa. The Nylanth not being head honcho is a revelation. Pretend that you didn't know any of this about the Nylanth. Imagine that you just beat the game for the first time and hadn't read any supplementary material. I'd be willing to bet you'd have no idea about any of this. The idea of the Nihilanth being enslaved by a greater power is one of the biggest plot points of the game, and directly springboards us to the sequel where said greater power controls Earth. And it's so easy to miss! Sure, G-Man says that his employers are in control of Zen after you kill the Nihilanth, but who in 1998 knew what that meant? Who knows what it means now? My point is, I really like the story of Half-Life. I think the massive interdimensional conflicts into that are super interesting. It's definitely engrossing, especially at this point. That being said, I also find that unless you're willing to scour for every tiny detail and look through every nook and cranny, most of the real genius of said story will be totally lost on you. Again, I like it when a game can leave you to your own devices to figure stuff out on your own, but the degree to which Half-Life's story depends on this is absurd. Most discussion on the narrative I've seen is more so based on individual theories than anything concrete. That's fun, but it's ultimately frustrating that nobody can agree on anything. The ambiguity is a lot of people's reasons for liking Half-Life. That's obviously valid, and I can see why they like that, but personally, I think it can be way too obstructed at times. Moving on from the narrative and on to a less dense but equally interesting subject, I want to focus on the atmosphere. The atmosphere and general mood is hands down my favorite aspect of the game. Black Mesa is a massive and massively foreboding place even before the Resonance Cascade. I love how big the whole facility is, and how the sleek, cutting-edge technology and use contrasts heavily against the cold, harsh environments that house it. It very rarely feels like a real place, but it doesn't need to. The environments and how they feel, not necessarily how they're designed from a gameplay perspective, all do exactly what they need to. After a while, some of it can get kinda samey, but that usually doesn't last too long. Every once in a while you'll get topside, but it doesn't take long before you're forced underground again. Unless you're playing with the HD pack enabled, I don't feel like there are any clashing aesthetics. Obviously, this is a game from 1998, but the art direction is consistent and well maintained throughout. Now, if you've made it this far, you're probably wondering why I said this game sucks. So far, this has been a basically positive review of Half-Life. I've praised its story and atmosphere, as well as acknowledged its influence over the industry, where the game falls apart for me is with literally everything else. That may sound hyperbolic, but I assure you it's not. The entirety of Half-Life's gameplay to me is fucking atrocious. Although some of my gripes can be attributed to the game's age and ideals of its time, I struggle to imagine most of its faults being acceptable even in 98. This is going to be the meatiest chunk of the video, partially because it's the biggest part of the game, and partially because, after playing, it left such a bad taste in my mouth that I'm baffled as to how anyone praises Half-Life's gameplay in the modern day. Before heading off to this part of the video properly, though, I want to make something clear. If you love the gameplay of the original Half-Life, I honestly envy you. I went in fairly neutral and with an open mind, and I just couldn't find anything to enjoy about it. So, if you love it, more power to you. I'm not trying to tell you you're wrong, I'm just stating how I feel. With all that out of the way, I'm going to start with what bothered me the least and work my way up to the more frustrating things. The platforming is terrible. Fortunately, you don't have to do it much. I know it's mostly a product of the time, but Gordon moves with this insane momentum and speed that makes him extremely sensitive and difficult to control. This makes sense in Doom or Quake, which Half-Life is built off of, but I find it inappropriate here. Adding to this, Gordon slides everywhere like he's on ice. This makes everything way harder than it has to be. Sometimes just going through a doorway can be frustrating because you'll slide past each side and Gordon's hitbox is just a little bit wider than I'd like it to be. During combat, this can turn from just annoying to downright frustrating. I can't count the number of times I took damage just because Gordon's fat ass roller skated past what should have been an easily entered doorway. Sometimes during platforming, you're required to make these pinpoint accurate leaps from the most obtuse angles possible. This simply blows. Sometimes, for seemingly no reason, Gordon will stop dead in the air right after you jump, leaving him plummeting to his death. I think this might be due to how the Gold Source engine handles slopes. 
Basically, instead of sliding down a slight decline like in every other FPS since, like, 2000, in Half-Life, Gordon hops down. So I guess sometimes you don't even start off with the momentum you need because Gordon just came down off the tiniest ramp imaginable and doesn't carry that momentum like you would on a flat surface. Regardless of the reasoning, it sucks. Even if I never had to jump between two suspended objects in the game ever, the movement itself would be enough to frustrate me continually. The default walking speed is a sprint, and the walking walking speed is way too slow. Either way, I think the movement system is terrible, and doesn't really belong in a game as slow as Half-Life. Man, the puzzles in this are pretty lame. They range from being absolutely terrible to just being kinda there. There were few puzzles I found engaging, and none that were especially difficult. A few highlights, and by highlights I mean pieces of shit, were this box puzzle in Blast Pit, which is so janky it's unbelievable, and the damn puzzle in Surface Tension, which is honestly just broken. The box puzzle is janky because the quote-unquote physics suck, and because I think the physics are tied to the FPS. I'm not certain, but it's hard to imagine they're supposed to be this fast. I've also seen speedrunners use them as a tactic to traverse huge areas in seconds. The damn puzzle is busted because the visual language is lacking. See, I got that I was supposed to press the button and turn the valve to open the gates underneath the dam. What I didn't understand was this black wall behind the gates. For the longest time I thought I was missing something because, at a glance, I can't go past that. Turns out though, Valve just couldn't be bothered to render the other side of the dam from here. The flashlight doesn't even do anything to it, you just gotta assume this wall isn't real. Maybe I'm the only person to have trouble with that, but still, at a glance that doesn't look like the right way to go, does it? The rest of the puzzles aren't as bad, but they're still not good. Basically, you enter a map, some machine needs to be turned on, and it's 50-50 whether or not this is adequately explained to you. You need to press a button on one side of the map, and then pull a lever on the other side of the map. In between these two actions, you'll probably need to clear out some filler. It can be difficult, not because any of the puzzles are brain teasers, but because the level design is horrible. Again, I know this kind of level design was in vogue at the time, but it has not aged well. The amount of times I was stuck wandering around an area absolutely clueless about what I was supposed to be doing is ridiculous. The game can be infuriatingly coy about what it needs you to do. Many times, this will lead to you backtracking through an area with fuck all to do in it since you've likely already cleared out all the enemies. This segment in Power Up, for instance. When you reach the area, you're probably going to be focused on the Gargantua. After a moment, though, your eyes will lead you to this hallway. It's lit up, and it's the only real place of refuge. You enter, kill a few Vortigaunts, flip the power switch, break the box jamming these mechanisms, kill a few soldiers, and... what? Where do you go? Not that it was ever telegraphed or hinted at, but you have to run through this previously barred off tunnel that's shrouded in darkness, lure the Gargantua, flip the circuit breaker to kill it, and then you can safely get back to the rail cart. The game is filled with counterintuitive level design like this. Hell, half the time the game will just kill you as punishment for being in the wrong place at the wrong time, as if you're supposed to know any better. This air vent with the soldiers where the falling debris will crush you, this falling pipe and power up that will kill you if you dare be below 40 health, the top of this thing in Blast Pit, this stupid fucking fan in Blast Pit if you don't know that climbing a ladder backwards is way faster than climbing it forwards. There are a ton of these fuck you moments throughout the game, and at first they were just kind of annoying, but by the end I swear I could have crushed a brick with my bare hands. Now, no video on Half-Life would be complete without mentioning Zen, and talking about all of its shortcomings. Honestly, Zen wasn't awful. Sure, it's far from a highlight, and suffers from vague objectives maybe more so than any part of the game previously, but it's just kinda meh. The platforming sucks just as much as any other part of the game. The Gone Ark fight is okay, I guess, though its babies can fuck right off. This part with the friendly Vortigaunt sucks because there are some non-friendly ones right next to them, leading to a sneak attack that doesn't really make any sense. I think Zen looks pretty cool at times, but overall it's just kinda there for me. So, so far I've praised Half-Life's story and atmosphere, acknowledged its influence, and critiqued some of the gameplay design. Nothing has been especially damning so far though. Sure, the game can be dickish and unclear sometimes, but is that really enough to make me hate it? Not really. If that was it, I certainly wouldn't like the game, but I couldn't bring myself to hate it either. No, the reason I hate this game is that, in addition to its myriad design flaws, Half-Life sports some of the most unfair, unfun, bullshit combat I've ever seen in a game. If the game had no combat at all and was just exploration, puzzles, and platforming, it would still blow, but it wouldn't enrage me. All of these elements combined create one of the least fun and most erratic games I've ever played. Without further ado, let's get into the combat. For the first 45 minutes to an hour, it's fine. You rarely confront any enemies, and even when you do, you can oftentimes run past them. This all changes and we've got hostiles when the military arrives. Now, their introduction is great, but fighting them becomes a fucking chore before long. 
The first few areas with them aren't too bad. There are relatively few of them, and it almost seems like it'll become more fun to fight them as the game progresses. Before long, however, again, we run into some problems. For starters, almost none of the weapons feel satisfying to use. To me, the revolver, crossbow, and the glue-on gun are the only weapons that feel even remotely good to fire. The rest feels super weak. The Glock is fine, but its alt-fire mode is borderline useless. The SMG is, again, just fine. The crowbar is, well, it's a crowbar. Grenades either go too far or not far enough, and the damage they deal feels really inconsistent. The RPG is actually pretty good. The Tau Cannon is probably pretty good, but there's almost no ammo for the thing and its introduction is botched. For some reason, Valve decided to put its introductory sequence in a room right next to an active combat area. You may hear a scientist and a security guard argue faintly in the background as you focus on killing these soldiers, but you'll almost certainly miss what they're actually doing and saying. Anyway, the satchel charges are actually pretty handy. The trip mines are not. I never got a single enemy to walk into one. The hive hand is terrible, and the snarks are counterproductive at best. Oh, and the shotgun. At first that feels like it has some oomph to it, until you repeatedly blast soldiers in the face with it at point blank range to no effect. Yeah, Half-Life has a huge balance problem. The soldiers take an absurd amount of damage, and Gordon, unless his suit is at full charge, can barely take any. The combat quickly becomes a slog, simply because these motherfuckers won't die. So many times I'd round a corner, be face to face with a soldier, and unload an entire magazine into his chest to no avail, only for the soldier to shoot me like twice and take me out. They don't even flinch to show they're taking damage. Sure, there are these tiny blood splotches, but that's hardly a good indication of anything. Adding to this, they love to lob grenades. I don't strictly mind them throwing grenades to flush you out of cover, but goodness gracious they go overboard. All their weapons being hit scanned means it's impossible to weave around their attacks. Exit cover and you will be hit, because they also just shoot a lot. This quickly became aggravating for me. Before I started my playthrough, I read from some people online that I'd have to be smart about how I play. Use my weapon in cunning ways, outthink the enemy, and in general, think like a theoretical physicist would in this situation. Man, I tried. I really did. I tried to use all my weapons in different ways. I tried to outsmart the enemy. I tried to outmaneuver the enemy. I tried to plan and I tried to play strategically. Thing is though, this isn't Rainbow Six or Bioshock. Honestly, I have no idea how people think of Half-Life as anything resembling a tactical shooter. My thought is that they've just played it through so much that it's overblown in their minds. Sure, it's easy to plan an attack strategy once you've been through an area a hundred times, but this simply isn't how it works for a first time player. Strategy was not a factor in my playthrough. It really couldn't have been. Most times, you're either ambushed or you enter a room where you just didn't know any enemies would be, since there are rarely any audio cues or tells to speak of. I would say it's mostly about improvisation. You're thrust into an encounter, you have to adapt and think quickly. This all falls apart though because, again, every enemy is a fucking tank, and because they behave so erratically, it's almost impossible to exploit or get the jump on them. Even when I could plan and execute some strategy, it almost never worked. The enemy would either not die like they should have, or they would seemingly gain omniscience and snuff me out before I could do anything. I'm getting ahead of myself a little, but I just want to say Half-Life has the most cheap enemy placement I've ever seen. Half the time, they'll be perched in a place you never could have known about. Sometimes they'll surround you out of nowhere when you don't have any cover. This sniper and Forget About Freeman is some of the biggest bullshit I've ever seen. Sure, this all feels like stuff an actual military would do to kill a target, but it's far from an enjoyable or rewarding gameplay experience. Although most of my problems with the combat have to do with the soldiers, the aliens can be just as big a dicks. Headcrabs teleport in all over the place all the time, and it gets old fast. Come to think of it, most of the aliens do that. Yes, I know there's a canon reason for it, but shit, it gets just tiresome after a while. This section in Forget About Freeman is perhaps the worst example of it. After you kill the two grunts in this room, about three to four waves of grunts and vortigaunts spawn in in rapid succession. There's no warning, it's a pretty small area with no real cover, you're attacked from all sides and it's just not fun at all. It's not even challenging in a good way, it just throws a ton of stuff at you at once. Eventually, I just resorted to using a crossbow on the first grunts before they could, or were supposed to, detect me. 
I also did this on a cliff in surface tension, because dealing with the enemies properly was a huge waste on health and resources. Half-Life promotes save scumming like no game I've ever seen before. The autosaves are pretty spaced out, and a lot of things rely on trial and error. Eventually, once I got really sick of the combat, I would quick save after every tiny victory, because I knew I was likely to die in some dumb way sooner than later. Some dumb way, like having your own weapon turn on you. Yeah, a lot of times when I tried to think creatively, it either wouldn't matter or it would backfire spectacularly and kill me. In theory, the snarks are supposed to distract the enemy so you can deal with them easier. In my playthrough, anytime I tried to use the snarks for this exact reason, they'd immediately turn around, attack me, explode, and either take off most of my health or straight up kill me. Sometimes I'd kill an enemy in a doorway, try to run through said doorway, and couldn't, because their bodies have collision way after they die. In the confusion, I'd get gunned down. Other times I'd think I was safe behind cover, only to be destroyed by some fucking bees that I can't run or hide from. I'm honestly not sure if I've ever been more angry at a game. The funny thing is, the AI isn't even good, so all the challenge is arbitrary. People love to bring up that the AI can do only one thing at a time, attack or run. This doesn't matter at all when there's 10 of them and I'm being attacked from 7 different angles. Sometimes this can even lead to the AI exposing themselves in really stupid ways. A bunch of times I'd see a soldier drop a grenade at his own feet, scream, and then not move as it exploded. Other times I'd catch them in the middle of setting a grenade, shoot them in the huge window of time I had, then watch them collapse and get jibbed by the explosion. I know they're trying to lure me, but it never worked due to how obvious it was. Even if Valve made it so that it was more difficult to discern when they were dropping a grenade, it's a lose-lose situation. I either see the intent and avoid it, or I miss it and it's yet another cheap death. Sometimes the soldiers will attempt to flank you. This is a far cry better than anything else in 1998 as far as AI goes, but it's still pretty rudimentary. Hell, the only way I know they're using these tactics is because they tell us constantly. The challenge for me comes through in finding the will to complete the game. The soldiers aren't difficult because they're cunning. They're hard because they ambush constantly, deal way too much damage, take way too much damage, and have superhuman perception. I can't stress enough how frustrating dealing with the combat in this game was for me. After about the thousandth time I double barrel blasted a soldier just for him to not even stagger, I considered the possibility that everyone's love for this game might just be a long-running practical joke. So many goddamn times the game just launches you into a situation you couldn't possibly be prepared for. Planning and strategic play are impossible. The game does not reward intelligence. The game rewards saves coming and misplaced perseverance. I never felt like I got through any difficult room of soldiers because my skill at the game had increased. It always just felt really lucky. The AI would fuck up and I would take advantage. In Half-Life, I died because I stood between a moving rail cart and a wall at the wrong angle. I died because the game would ask me to make the most nonsensical leaps of faith with the worst movement mechanics ever. I died because the floor fell out from under me. I died because of a sniper I never could have known was there. I died because I got stuck in the level geometry. I died because the enemy fires ammunition that can go around corners. I died because I was constantly fighting against an army entirely comprised of super soldiers. I died a lot, and seldom did it feel like it was my own fault. Playing Half-Life in 2021 was a constant test of my patience. The asinine level design, the stupidly difficult combat, the pathetic puzzles, the unclear objectives, the awful platforming, the shitty weapons, the dreadful enemies, etc, etc. If there's any lesson to take away from this, it's that the next negative review you see of this on Steam might just be coming from a genuine place, so don't immediately disregard it. All in all, I appreciate the original Half-Life, I really do. I fucking hated playing it, but I appreciate what it spawned, and I love a lot of things that were influenced by it. In 2021, however, the only value I see in Half-Life 1 is that it allowed Valve to create much, much, much better things later on.